Local productions seen on Delta College Public Media are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello everyone, welcome to Junior Doan's The Spark. I'm Junior Doan and thank you for joining us. Today, my guest is Lynette Clemetson. Lynette is the Charles R. Eisendraft Director of the Wallace House Center for Journalists at the University of Michigan. Welcome, Lynette. So, um, I'm really excited to ask about the center to which I have been occasionally in past uh, years but it's uh, quite new to a lot of people, and I'd love you to describe what is the center currently doing. Thank you so much for having me, Junia. And it's a pleasure to talk about the work of the Wallace House Center for Journalists. And it's always been a pleasure to see you at our events. And it's wonderful to have this opportunity to explain our work to more people. Um, many people actually pass by the Wallace House Center for Journalists in Ann Arbor and are not sure actually what they're walking past. We are a center um, uh, affiliated with the provost office and engaged learning at the University of Michigan. And we work to elevate and sustain the careers of journalists. What does that mean? Well, we do that through three programs. We have the Knight Wallace Fellowships for Journalists which brings accomplished journalists to the university every year for a year of immersive study. We have the Livingston Awards for young journalists, which recognizes excellence uh, in reporting by journalists under the age of 35 each year. And the Livingston Awards happen every year in New York. Uh, I know yeah. you've, you've been. Wonderful. And, um, and then we have our Wallace House events uh, series, which does public events about journalism to bring transparency to the work of journalists and underscore the vital role that journalism plays uh, in our in any functioning society and certainly in our democracy. Let's just stay with the third. How how do you encourage or amplify transparency? Hmm. I mean, I think it's so important now because we are living through a period of years, not just in the United States, but around the world where autocracy is on the rise and leaders who wish to undermine the free flow of information, factual information in society, one of the tactics um, that leaders use is to try to cast journalists as the enemy of the people and try to cast real news as somehow as fake news. Um, and, and so I think that it's really important for news organizations and organizations like Wallace House to try to really make it clear, not just the stories that journalists do, but how they do that work, why they do that work, and actually bring attention to the fact that journalists uh, are working for the public good, representing the people, trying to bring accountability um, to the functioning of government and society. And so when we have events where we're talking about um, journalism, we're not just talking about the subject of the work, but we have journalists talk about how they approached their reporting, um, how they checked their facts. I'll give you an example. Um, in, uh, in November, we brought two journalists uh, from the New York Times, Jody Cantor and Megan Tuohy, to for a public event um, for their work uncovering the Harvey Weinstein scandal and decades of sexual abuse by this, a very powerful movie producer. Jody and Megan's story came out in 2017. It launched the Me Too movement, really had a fundamental change in our society. They wrote a book 
based on their reporting. And that reporting this year has been turned into a major motion picture. We screened the film at the Michigan Theater. And after the film, uh, I brought Jody and Megan onto stage and gave the audience a chance to talk to them about their work. And it was incredible. It was a really magnificent evening. We had close to 1,200 people filling the Michigan Theater, more than 400 students there. And um, it was wonderful to be able to see the real life journalists who had been depicted on screen to come out and just talk about how long an investigation like that takes, how difficult it is to get people to go on the record, especially women who have faced abuse and retaliation uh, from someone in a, in a position of great power. And so I felt like at the end, Yes, people had seen a Hollywood movie, but they left really understanding um, with, a, with a degree of depth what goes into producing that kind of journalism and why it's important and why, um, why people need to support journalism and what distinguishes that type of journalism from a lot of the misinformation that's flowing through everyone's uh, devices today. What do you make of story and storyline? I read now so much uh, is framed around the story. Uh, the question isn't really what is the story, but how do you make or how does the broad realm make a decision about which stories to highlight? Well, there are a couple of questions. In, there are a couple of questions in there, right? Because there's a the, you're asking a question about which stories take prominence in any given uh, day or news cycle, and then how those stories are told. I think those are different issues. Um, you know, I am probably one that is unconventional, and I, I think in our in our system we have a, a dominance of cable news networks and a dominance of people following two or three stories a day that tend to dominate every hour of the news cycle. And while certainly those the stories in any given day are worth pursuing, I think I'm more a proponent of encouraging people to look closely at the stories that are slightly off of the main lead um, and stories that add depth, not just a kind of competitive horse race or um, somebody's talking points, but things that help you understand the context behind what's driving a major issue of the day. And so, you know, every publication has their way of deciding which stories lead the paper, whether they're national, whether they're international, um, whether they're about politics, whether they're about healthcare or medicine, whether they're about social issues. But then I think it's about structure. And I think, you know, there's an interesting question that you asked about how do you tell stories? I think this is an enormous challenge today because we have information flowing at us, all of us, um, from so many different directions. I think that there's more of a challenge for journalists than ever to tell stories in a way that grabs people. And I don't just mean grabs people gratuitously, um, but grabs them in a way that helps them relate to, helps a story relate to their lives, relate to what's important decisions that influence how their lives do or don't work, how their society, their community does or doesn't function. Um, and so, you know, I'm a fond of telling, I'm fond of telling journalists, yes, you have to have the reporting right, but you can have great facts and not hold someone's attention. And so you have to have, you have to have the information accurate, but you also have to really be thinking about the audiences you are seeking to reach and the audiences that you wish to serve and make sure that the stories you're telling are relevant to those audiences. And I, I think that, that this goes back to the earlier point I made about democracy. One of the things that has been most troubling about the loss of local and regional news uh, 
where we feel this greatly here in the Midwest and across the South is that so much of our news is nat national in scope and focuses on Washington and New York uh, and the West Coast that people don't see their own realities reflected in the top stories or the arguments or debates of the day. And I think when people don't see themselves reflected, they tune out. And when people tune out, it leaves them open to um, whatever information is presenting itself. And it's left a great opening for misinformation. And I see, you know, I think we can all see the, the ramifications of that through a lot of the chaos um, over the past several years that really has left our democracy sort of teetering on the brink of collapse, I would say. So you've lived in many places and worked in many places. Yeah. Do you think the attention span of, of the local population varies depending on culture or news? I started my career in the early 90s, and I was based in, uh, in Asia, in Hong Kong. Um, and really, even before that, started uh, working in radio in college in Pittsburgh. I don't know that I've seen any differences in culture, but the difference has been in the speed of information and the way people consume and the disruption of the media industry and the fact that at any given time, right, people have information coming from their laptop, they have information coming from their watch, they have information coming from their phones, they have information coming through their car speakers or their um, Bluetooth speakers that are in their ear and it, and it, and there's so in, in some ways people have access to more information than ever, but it creates a sense of clutter. And so I think the shortening of attention span isn't because people don't want in-depth information. I just think that we have to work a little bit harder to get information in front of people and, and to connect it, connect it to them. Uh, what I'm thinking about is the onset of uh, the web and social media and this and that takes from our time and takes from our, or adds to our source of uh, information. And therefore, does it change our thinking in some way? So for example, sometimes I wish instead, uh, it's terrible to say this, but instead of a long article, give me the bullet points. What happened? <laughs> because I'm gonna read this and then I'm going to read something else. On the other hand, a lot of times I say to myself, where's the context? for what's being told to me. You know, how do I make sense of it in a in, broader picture? Is it in, unique or is it just repetitive? Whatever the whatever is. And I, I'm sort of getting around to, is one of the roles you could consider at the center, just checking that out and being a source of how can informed citizens be informed? I mean, what are the things and help the journalist ponder about that too? Um, um, I, I don't, I, I'm sort of directing you, I don't really mean to be that, but it's a wonderful opportunity to hear from you about how people, uh, the journalists write for or speak to or however they do it to, put, that's what I was asking, is it different biculturally, uh, depending on where you live? Do they look for things bec differently because their culture is different? And um, Maybe not. Maybe that's just a silly question. I know personally, I have found that what I read, I say, okay, this person said that or wrote that, and <laughs> let me wait for the next person to counter or whatever it is. Do we have more of a dialogue as a result? Gosh, that's a complicated question. Again, I don't think that there are huge cultural differences in what people want to see. I actually think what you just articulated is very natural and something that hasn't changed over time, right? There's a certain level of news that people want um, a brief snapshot, bullet points of here are the important things you need to know for the day. I think this has been true for decades, right? This is why even if you go back 
to say go back five or six decades to newspapers. That's why newspapers were structured the way they were structured, because you want to be able to look at headlines and say, okay, war happening there. Okay, um, you know, prices going up or down here. Okay, this company is having a scandal here. You're able to scan the headlines, get a quick read on what's happening, and then decide where you want to dive deeper. In the same respect, when everybody uh, watched the evening news, right? The evening news was a 30 minute broadcast structured to give people kind of a quick hit with teases before the commercial break. Up next, we're going to talk about this, 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 and this, and you can decide what you wanted to, to stay longer for. And on topics that you wanted to linger on, you might watch a longer show like 60 Minutes or Frontline. I don't think the habit of wanting to toggle between brief information and then points where you can dive deep has changed. I just think the mechanisms in which we do it have changed. When you were living in Hong Kong and Japan, how did you adjust? There's always an adjustment period, in my opinion, when people move, even in America. But um, certainly, I know you had an interest and in, you studied in the area, at school in the area. But what, what surprised you? What changes did you have to make yourself? If um, you can remember. Yeah, so, so I did my master's degree in East Asian studies, and I uh, did intensive language study in Taiwan. And so I think when you start with language study, you're already starting with, I want to immerse myself in a certain culture. I made sure, you know, when I first moved to Taiwan that I was living in an area where there were not a lot of other Americans. So I would have to force myself to um, really become proficient in the language. I mean, I think I did maybe an extreme version of this. I actually lived in a place that did not have a real kitchen. So I had to eat out um, and I, and I lived near the university, but along a certain alley with a lot of local mom and pop shops and having to get out and interact every day helped me not just learn the language in a textbook way, but in a vernacular way and really listen to how people speak. And, um, and I think that was the best thing for my language. When I moved to Hong Kong, I had finished graduate school and was really focused on working. And so I'm glad that I had the more academic time before that because it made me more comfortable um, with the cultural, with the cultural transition and with the language transition. So when I moved to Hong Kong, I had been studying Mandarin. I never studied Cantonese. Um, and so I was always, I, I never had a full level of comfort in Hong Kong because I didn't speak the local language, but enough people could function in Mandarin. And I came to the point where I could understand enough Cantonese uh, and enough people, of course, spoke English because it was a former British colony. And when I moved there, it was still a British colony um, that that I could move around. But I but I think, you know, you can when you spend time overseas, you can come at it from two different ways. You can you can come at it from the cultural immersion perspective and you are mm -hmm. working, you're working as an element of that cultural immersion. The other way to do it is that a job sends you somewhere and you just get plopped down in a place for work uh, and you learn the culture and a, as you go along. I prefer it, I prefer doing it starting with the cultural immersion. Uh, and I think that's how I, how I approach my reporting as well. Um, so of course it takes time, but I, I think that that's what makes it interesting. And, and I, I always, um, if I caught myself sort of defaulting to uh, too, too much American culture, I would pull back and, um, 
and kind of recenter myself because it just wasn't the point of the time that I was spending there. And, and I also would say that of the, so I guess in full, I, I lived in East Asia for six years, roughly two years in Taiwan and, and a little shy of four years in Hong Kong. And, um, and one of the things that struck me during that whole time period is how much more technologically advanced things were there than they were in the United States and and um, and society, especially in Hong Kong, where the population density was intense and, and still is, you have to create an efficient society when you have extreme density. And so there were things about the way um, society worked, the way public transportation worked, the way housing uh, functioned, the way neighborhoods um, uh, and, and sort of the cohesion among small units of people and families worked that I took to quite well. And when I came back to the United States, it was more of an adjustment to come back and readjust to the way we did things in the United States, I think, than, than it was to, to move to, um, to move to Asia. Did it uh, entice you to spend more time of your life there? My goodness. I mean, I, when, I, when I first got there, again, because I was starting with language study, so I, I had an intent to be there. I mean, the way things happened, I was hired by Newsweek magazine and I moved to the Washington Bureau and became a national correspondent. But there was a period of time there that I thought I could easily be there for 10 years or more because um, the changes that were happening, the politics, the social issues, the restructuring of society was so interesting um, in the 90s that as a reporter and somebody who's just naturally interested in learning about different cultures, there was just always something interesting to be pursuing. And though I lived in Hong Kong, I covered Southeast Asia. So my coverage territory included Hong Kong, Taiwan, um, Malaysia, Singapore, the Philippines, Vietnam. Uh, and so I spent a lot of time traveling. And you know, who wouldn't, I mean, who wouldn't want that? It was, it was a dream, a dream job and a dream time in my career. Uh, professionally, you moved uh, almost every two years, a little less, a little more. Uh, how did that all come about? I guess, you know, I was in Washington. I was based in Washington uh, for, from the time I, I left Asia in August of 1998 and didn't leave Washington until I came here to the university um, in 2016. So I was, I was based in Washington, DC for a very long time. Uh, and during the time that I was in DC, I worked for Newsweek, the New York Times and NPR, um, and also did a, a startup for the Washington Post company. But I think, you know, DC was a great place to be based as a national correspondent once I was back in the United States and figuring out how to understand the United States again. You know, being a journalist is a great way to um, understand any culture, even your own. And uh, I was lucky enough to work for large news organizations that at the time had uh, a strong desire to cover the country and uh, and had, you know, wonderful jobs. Built and on. In, between, in between that time, I went from being a reporter into the news leadership side and, and doing strategy and newsroom management. And so my career changed. And in the middle of that time in 2009 was the first time that I came here to Wallace House. I'm sitting in Wallace House now in my office. and. Um, I'm director now, but I first came here as a fellow in 2009, and I spent my year here as a fellow studying the editorial and financial viability of new news models. And it was a time when the- Were, were your parents risk takers like you? Risk, uh, my goodness. I mean, 
my father worked for the railroad and was an electrician and climbed poles to handle signal outages and traveled all around the Midwest in storms in great danger. So yes, I suppose um, he was a risk taker. Um, you know, I think that, I think I, journalism just, I just was always a curious, um, a curious child and, uh, and really wanted to understand why people lived the way they lived, why societies and communities are structured the way they're structured, why some people um, always seem to have advantage and why other people always seem to struggle with disadvantage. And I think if you are curious I mean, what better field is there to go into? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Most fascinating discussion. I tell you what we have learned, uh, I have learned today. And one is it's good to have curiosity. I, yes. I like that. It makes for an enriched life. As she said, journalism is uh, a way to investigate the world by implication and to be a perpetual student by implication. Uh, she has tremendous grit to uh, launch off, as I mentioned, to these different jobs and different places in the world and to make this, the situation, the experience her own, uh, not always an easy thing to do. She came back and is now at, at the, the center uh, with a uh, really reputable and admirable goals, uh, uh, you know, recognizing helping young journalists, recognizing giving awards to, uh, to the junior journalists and, um, and to work on transparency and honesty or clarity at least uh, of what we're going to experience and what the responsibilities of the media are, the, the word media, I don't know what we'll call you. So thank you very much, delightful as always. And um, I remember, I always say to my audience, go out and do something kind for someone you know and someone you don't know every day. See you next time. Absolutely. All right. To contact Junia, send her an email at juniadonesthespark at gmail.com. For more information, program schedules, and news about future guests, go to www.juniadonethespark.com. Dot com. Thank you for joining us. See you next time on Junia Dones The Spark. Local productions seen on Delta College Public Media are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you.